Welcome to another episode of Three Plastic Surgeons and a Microphone, starring, as always, Dr. Sam Tajurakar from Dallas, Texas, Instagram handle at Sam Tajurakar, Dr. Sal Pacella from La Jolla, California, his Instagram handle is at San Diego Plastic Surgeon, and I'm Sam Ree from Paramus, New Jersey. My Instagram handle, as always, is at Bergen Cosmetic. You can get all our episodes at www.3plasticsurgerypodcast.com. Uh, as always, our disclaimer, this show is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is for informational purposes only. Treatment and results may vary based on circumstances, situation, and medical judgment after appropriate discussion. Always seek the advice of your surgeon or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding medical care, and never disregard professional medical advice or dis delay seeking advice because of something in this show. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Pacella. How are you? Very good. Gentlemen, welcome. How are you guys? Doing great. Doing great. <laughs> awesome. Well, as you as you can see here, we've got a little bit of a theme here. Everybody's got a little bit of maize and blue on. So let's uh let's just see. I got my uh or is it my Michigan rugby uh mm -hmm. gear on that left a lot of blood in Ann Arbor um years ago. So um <laughs> We have a special theme of this show going on, um, talking about our time at Michigan, and we have a very special guest we'd like to, to bring on. So um, I wanted to introduce our former or our, our uh, former professor and current chairman at the University of Michigan, Dr. Paul Siderna. Paul is the Robert O'Neill Professor of Plastic Surgery and the chief of the section of plastic surgery um, at the University of Michigan. He specializes in complex wounds. He's an incredible incredible surgeon. Um, he combines a, an incredible expertise in general surgery, microsurgery, and plastic surgery, and also has a, a very uh, uh, productive lab in the, in the Division of Biomedical Engineering at the university. Uh, Paul received his Bachelor's of Science in Biomedical Engineering at the University of Michigan College of Engineering and his MD, MD degree from the University of Michigan Medical School. Uh, he completed general surgery and a fellowship in microsurgery at the University of Iowa and then came back to Michigan, uh, where he completed his plastic surgery training. He then completed two additional years in the muscle mechanics laboratory at the University of Michigan. Uh, Paul is uh, just a tremendous giant academically. He's had a very active research enterprise directing the neuromuscular research laboratory at the University of Michigan. Um, he's received over $29 million in direct research funding, has authored over 350 scientific manuscripts, and published 27 book chapters, presenting his work over 800 times in national and international meetings, and has been asked to give over 400 presentations. Um, professionally, he's been the chairman of the American Board of Plastic Surgery. That's the main uh, board that's responsible for board certification for uh, all plastic surgeons. He's been the chairman of the Plastic Surgery Research Council, the president of the American Society for Peripheral Nerve Surgery. He's, the, he's been a former president of the Michigan Academy of Plastic Surgery and president for the Plastic Surgery Foundation. There is um, the only thing that's bigger uh, then Dr. Sederna's CDs, CD, CV are the rims on his uh, SUV. So, <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Sal. That's really nice. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, basic, all right, basic, Paul. Well, thank you. That introduction just tells me I like work too much. That's all. <laughs> 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 well, Paul, welcome. It's uh, it's been fantastic to connect with you. We've uh, we've been uh, friends and colleagues over many many years, and um, you know we really appreciate you taking the time to to come on and chat with us about uh, everything you do at the university and and kind of uh, you know we'll reminisce a little bit about our time there. So uh, you know these these two jokers I'm with here can certainly recall many stories with with you and us and uh you know it's just been an honor to uh to get to know you as a as a teacher professor and colleague so yeah thanks so guys i gotta tell you i love seeing the michigan swag it looks so good <laughs> it warms my heart <laughs> i i want to so, wear this before the football season starts just before i'm ashamed you know before the ohio state game so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, at least we just crushed him in the resident bowl at asps so if our football yes. win at least our our like plastic surgeons do dominated them 
So that's good. Yeah. yeah. So, so Paul, tell us, tell us a little bit about your, your life as chairman there. You know, what, what do you uh, do with uh, teaching with the residents? What's your, what's your average week? Um, you know, how is it structured? Yeah. So, so thanks. So, you know, since all of us trained in plastic surgery at Michigan, we are a really different place now. So we have 19 full-time plastic surgeons just at University of Michigan Hospital. And these are people that don't have private practices or side jobs or anything. They're all just right here. So it's a big place. We've got 28 residents, so lots of residents. Uh, we did over 4,000 major operations last year, uh, 30,000 clinic visits. It's just a busy place. And so, as you might imagine, in my role of keeping all the faculty happy, keeping all the residents happy, keeping all the business flowing forward. It's just, it's just a lot of, a lot of different things every single week, lots and lots of meetings, lots of managing people's issues. It's always HR, lots and lots of HR issues, but I got to tell you, we have such a great group that I absolutely love it. So for me anyway, in this job, I mean, I love operating, so I still operate two days a week. It's my favorite days of the week by far. Love operating, love spending that time in the OR, love being with the residents. It's just it's just relaxing. There's nothing else to do but just operate, teach, and enjoy the day. And then uh, I, have a, I know I have a day a week in clinic where I just see a ton of patients for the, a full day, and then uh, two days of paperwork, which are the days that are the least fun of all of them. And I think everyone would agree days of paperwork are probably the thing that is at least fun for everyone. But, uh, but yeah, I'm really proud of the place we have. We have this incredible collection of faculty members. We have such a, a gifted group of trainees. Oh, my God, they're so smart. It's, it's really impressive. I love it. And there, there are um, many, many exciting things happening at the University of Michigan. When I um, left there in 2007, um, I, I recall that there were about four new brand new buildings coming up um, or that were being built in 2007, including a brand new children's hospital. Um, and then when I came back in 2014 as a visiting professor uh, at your invitation, um, all four of those buildings had been built and they were putting up five more buildings. I mean, it's just the endowment of Michigan is incredible. So tell us a little bit about what's happening happening there now? I mean, what's going up on campus? What's what's the exciting stuff around town? Yeah, so you know that, I mean, I think to see the vitality of a university, all you have to do is walk onto the campus and you've seen if there's a lot of building going on, you know that that place is really growing and developing and evolving and changing. And so there are many building projects going all the time. Uh, we are just getting ready to get back to constructing our new surgical tower, which we're all really excited about. It's going to be next to the current facilities that we have, uh, and it's going to be a brand new tower just for surgery. Huge tower, 12 stories, uh, wow. amazing. So we're all really excited about that. But we just finished building a new multidisciplinary outpatient center, which is also incredibly impressive. Um, and it's got you know, a bunch of operating rooms and a bunch of clinics. It's massive and beautiful. It's just, it's so exciting to be in such a vibrant community that's doing so well, you know, and we're kind of immune to a lot of the issues around the economy because the university just creates its own economy here in Ann Arbor. And that's what Ann Arbor is, is the University of Michigan. So it's nice. So in addition to having a, a large faculty, you have an incredible collection of faculty members as well. Some really internationally respected. What What is it about the uh, about the University of Michigan that's able to attract so many great and amazing plastic surgeons, both as faculty and residents? Yeah, so, so thanks, Sam. So, you know, the biggest thing about it, I think, more than anything is... You know, we are fully committed to the tripartite missions of academic surgery, of teaching, research, and clinical care. And people actually are given time for their research. So what does that mean? That means that everybody here has two full days a week to do research in whatever it is that they want to do research in. So Christian Berkler is one of our craniofacial surgeons. He has two graduate degrees in ethics. His research is in ethics. Steve Kasten has a graduate degree in education. His research is in education. We have Jen Walji runs this huge group of health services researcher. Her research is in opioid 
use and we have basic scientists, we have all these other things, but if people are given the time to get the research done, they can get things done. And when they do, then they publish papers, they get grants, they travel the world giving talks and they actually experience the benefits of academia. Um, otherwise, it's really not that dissimilar to, I mean, if you're just going to be a busy clinician operating five days a week, you can do that anywhere. You may not exactly have the job you want anywhere, but when people come here, they get something they can't get anywhere else. And that is the time to do the things that they really love, the time to do the things they're passionate about, the time that they can create something, innovate something, develop something that changes the specialty, changes the care of patients changes the way we do things going forward. And that being at the tip of the spear, best place to be for sure. Never want to follow, always want to lead. And this gives people a chance to do that. So when they get dialed in here, it's perfect because they have that time. Amazing. Now, um, now obviously with, um, you know, when we, when we were all residents there, um, you know, we understood what Michigan meant um, the University of Michigan meant to the state of Michigan and the region. Um, but for our listeners out here, tell us a little bit about what um, the University of Michigan health system means to the general community in the Midwest. Like what, what, what value does it provide for, for the entire state? Um, you know, where, do, where do you guys fit into the health care of the, of the state of Michigan and the, the Midwest in general? Yeah. So, so the University of Michigan is a big university and University of Michigan health system is a really big place. I think we have somewhere in the range of maybe 1,100 beds on, on campus here, something like that, 1,200 beds, a lot of beds. And it's a big, busy place. The thing is, is that it's the only big university hospital in the state. And in the Midwest, there, there are a few that are around that are really good, but there aren't that many places where you can take care of both the common things that you see in your local communities and everything, but then they're incredibly difficult things. And when you're coming from a place like this, where the person who invented ECMO is one of your faculty members, you know, now all of a sudden you have all these things, sick, sick patients coming in to get that kind of care. And most of us love being in a place that has opportunity to provide care to the sickest of people out there. And there just aren't that many places available for that, which means then that although we're in a small community of 110,000 people, we have a campus with 35,000 students, we have a hospital with 20,000 employees, and we have the sickest of sick patients in the entire region, which is, which is really an incredible opportunity for us. So the University of Michigan is, plays a very prominent role in all of that. And I love the fact that we can actually be that go-to place where there are really hard things happening and nobody takes care of them. For instance, last week I did this case, just a quick case. This was, this was amazing, a very unfortunate guy, but he had a massive sarcoma in his chest wall. And the thoracic surgeon cut a 45 centimeter hole through and through his chest, chest wall, diaphragm, abdominal wall. He needed this massive reconstruction and no one would touch this guy anywhere. And uh, we're like, Sounds great. Let's take care of them. Let's fix them. Love that. Amazing. Amazing. Well, yeah, go ahead, Samir. Well, I was going to say, you know, um, the thing that's always struck me as different about you compared to other academic chairmen is a lot of academic chairmen kind of reach this point where they're doing largely administrative stuff and they still don't have that passion for research or for surgery. And you still have both quite a bit. And what's, what's I've always loved about you is your modesty. You have an incredible faculty that's underneath you, but you're doing some pretty incredible things yourself. Um, and so, you know, it'd be awesome if you could share with our viewers some of the exciting things you're doing in your own lab. That would that's be- That's a great segue. Yep. Oh, well, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for that. Um, you know, I got to tell you, one of, my, one of my athletic heroes is this guy, um, Steve Eiserman, who is the captain of the Red Wings. Mm -hmm. Steve Eiserman wasn't one of these guys that got up and- you know, to his own horn or, or made a big deal about anything he was accomplishing. He was there for, he was the first one there to the rink every day. They play a game. He'd be back on the bike training for an hour and a half after the game. So he's the, the fittest, he had worked the hardest and he just was a servant leader. And I like to think of myself sort of the same way. 
you know, uh, it's really hard for me to tell people to do things if I'm not in the trenches with them. So um, it's, you know, all of that is really important to me. But anyway, okay, well, let me, can, can I show some slides then? Absolutely. 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 Yeah, let me show you some cool stuff. I'm going to show you some really cool stuff. Okay, here we go. Uh, let me bring this up here. Okay. Can you see my slides okay? Perfectly. All right, awesome. So I got to tell you, so there was this uh, TV show, 1973, The Six Million Dollar Man, and this show was awesome. And this guy, uh, Steve Austin, um, he uh, crashed a plane and he lost both his legs, an arm and an eye. And they decided to rebuild him with bionic parts. And I'm going to just play the trailer for this show for you. This, this is great. So that, I got to tell you, that show was awesome. But, you know, that's like 1973. That You know, that's almost 50 years ago. That is an old show. But, you know, and we're still trying to get there. And now, I mean, with inflation, it was the $6 million, man. But we're really closer to $6 billion now. <laughs> um, I, I got I to gotta tell you. Um, but, I mean, there's tons of amputations in North America alone. There are like 3 million people living with limb loss. So it's a huge problem. And if we think of what the prosthetics were like back in the like Civil War era, they looked like this. And then the 60s, they looked like this. And now they actually look basically the same. And they're run by cables and rubber bands. And we really haven't made any progress. So it's pretty depressing. So what it, people have actually tried to control prosthetics. So in the brain, the brain uh, has all the signals in it to control things. So there's an area in the brain that controls the hand. So people have actually put probes into the brain to pick up signals in the brain to control a prosthetic device. So I'll show you this video of somebody doing it. This woman here actually is using a probe in her brain to control this arm to bring this water bottle to her mouth. And it's actually pretty amazing that just with her brain, she's able to do that. Um, the problem is, is if somebody is young and they lose an arm, this probably isn't good enough control. And so we really need to do better. And so we started doing research in this area, really looking at the peripheral nerves. So instead of going to the brain, the brain will send those signals down the peripheral nerves. And then if we can pick the signals up from the peripheral nerves, we could control a prosthetic, but control it in a better way. So the way that we decided to do this is that you could dissect a nerve into different branches. And then if we put little pieces of muscle on the end of each of those nerve branches, then when a nerve signal comes down, this tiny little nerve signal comes down, we can amplify it with that piece of muscle. We can pick up the signal and then feed that to the prosthesis and get the prosthesis to move. And so here you can see one of these little, they're called RPNIs in the red box there, and a wire coming down into it. And you can actually see how much the that piece of muscle amplifies these nerve signals. Here's the tiny little noise and here's the signal. So it really works well. And so then if we implant electrodes into the nerve, the way it would work is your brain would say, move thumb. The signals would come down your nerve. It, the signals would get amplified by that piece of muscle. The electrode would pick up that signal, and then we could feed it to the prosthesis and get it to move. So I'll just show you this right here. So this white hand in the front is telling our patient what to do, and this is what he's doing with his computer avatar hand in the back. And it's green when he gets it right, and it's red when he gets it wrong. But you can see extending thumb, flexing index finger, flexing thumb, flex wrist, spread fingers. So he already has more control over his computer avatar hand than prosthetic hands can even do, which is really exciting for us because it tells us actually that we have the ability to give people function back that's better than the function they have. Here. Hey, yeah. Paul, can, can we just go back one slide here? Just yeah. that's um, 
just wanted to be clear about something. So um, to the uh, where you had the green avatar hand. So this uh, this decoding hand that's yeah. di that's directly from the patient's brain, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And there was no. This is the very first time he tried to control this computer avatar hand. No training, no anything. That's just his brain wow. doing what it always did when he had a hand. Right. So for our viewers out there, th this is. This is groundbreaking stuff here. These are electrodes in your brain, and you think I'm going to move my right thumb, and it shows up on the avatar on the on the uh, green side. Correct? Yep. 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 Amazing. So then, so then we take this. So this prosthesis right here. Wait a second. I'll show you this one right here. So he's controlling this hand. This is one of the most advanced hands out there. It takes, it takes four different electrodes, four different signals to be able to control this thumb. And all he's doing is he's imitating Phil. Phil's hand is just moving his normal hand and he's moving his prosthetic thumb. This is from his brain. This is from yeah. his brain, right? Well, the brain signals are coming down and we're picking them up off his RPNIs on his peripheral nerves. Yep. Wow. Yep. So then you watch here, we're asking him to just turn a key and watch. He'll just turn a key like thumb and index finger, just like you or I would turn a key with this prosthetic hand. So no one's actually been able to ever demonstrate anything like this before. So it's pretty sweet. And then here, watch. The interesting thing about this is, the interesting thing about this one right here is, if you watch here, these three fingers move as a single unit. This prosthetic, even though it's one of the most advanced prosthetics, these fingers don't move independently. They only move as a single unit. But you can watch how quickly he can just move these just by thinking about it. Amazing. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's really cool. And then you watch here. He can move his thumb and index finger around. So the thumb gives like 40% of the function of the hand. So if you can position that thumb in space, you can do almost anything. And then this is another one of our patients. She has a different prosthesis because... She's uh, got smaller arms, so this one, but you'll watch her and she's gonna move each of these fingers individually. So she can, has control over all five fingers. So the thing that's cool about this, you do see that the hand moves slower. This hand isn't as fast. So there's never been a good way to control these prosthetics. So there's never been a reason for the prosthetics companies to make really good ones. Um, but now that we have this way to control them, this is a great opportunity to, for them to now start making better prosthetics that move faster, that move more naturalistically. So now I want to talk about providing sensory feedback. So the way this works now is if we have a prosthesis that has sensory devices on the fingertips, the prosthesis can create an electrical signal when they grab something. We can take that electrical signal and we can stimulate the end of their nerves in a certain way and we can give them sensation back to their fingers. So what I'm going to show you is here, this setup, she's sitting here. We have an object here, it's a large can. And she is mimicking with her left intact hand, just kind of motion, but she's moving her avatar right hand and we're stimulating the nerves that go to her right hand that isn't there to give her a sensation of what might be in her hand. Do you got that? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> one more one more time. One more, okay, time. One more time. Okay. She is going to, with her avatar hand, that a hand she doesn't have, her, her phantom hand, she is going to grab this object, okay? And we are going to give her sensory feedback to give her a sense of how big that object is and how hard it is. So she isn't feeling anything other than the sensory feedback we're giving her. Okay. Does she does she know what the object is when she's grabbing she's it? Blindfolded. She's blindfolded and she has uh, headphones on, so she can't hear anything. 
Okay. So she doesn't know that it's a can. She doesn't know it's a key. She doesn't know it's a bag. Anything, Nothing. right? No. Okay. Right. And then we're stimulating all the nerves to all her fingers in the hand that isn't there. Avatar okay. hand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So large wow. can. Because it's squishy. And so we can stimulate it in a certain way so she knows it's small and it's squishy. So her avatar hand closes a lot until she feels it. And then it isn't a real hard stop. And we can do that with how we stimulate the nerves in her missing hand. <laughs> So you're, you're, yeah. So you're, you're creating these signals, correct? Yeah. Like, yeah. We have programmed how hard or soft it is. We've programmed how big or small it is. So when she starts closing her computer avatar hand, if it's a big object, we will immediately start stimulating her sensory nerves because her fingers are starting to touch it. And then if she closes her virtual hand even more will stimulate a lot if it's a hard object so she knows she can't move her fingers any further in her avatar hand but what this is this is demonstrating the reason we're doing it in this way is none of the prosthetics have good enough sensory feedback on them that we could do this with the prosthetic hand very easily so we've already gone way past what the prosthetics in the world can do amazing that is amazing yeah, so here, watch this one. I like this one. It's a more squeezable thing. She got stuffed animal. And then here with this one, she's blindfolded and she has um, headphones on because we don't want her to be able to hear the motors of the hand moving so she can figure out how big or small something is just based on how long the motors are running. So really testing if our sensory feedback is good. Wow. Yeah. It's so trippy. This, yeah. So this stuff is this stuff is super cool. It's so, really so so the, the value of this sensory motor feedback is the, the patients feel like it's their own hand. It's not just some stranger's hand, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and the thing that's interesting about it is, is a prosthesis, you don't want a prosthesis like a tool. You know, like you pick up a hammer and you've got a hammer in your hand. It's just like a tool. What we want is it's called embodiment. We want that thing to become part of their body. And, um, and if you can give them sensation back, now it's actually, now if they can move it like a hand and it has sensation, now it's like part of them. Yeah, so that stuff is really, really fun. It's really- That's amazing. Yeah. So, so Paul, this is, the, you know, for our viewers out here, this, this is absolutely groundbreaking research and it's right here in your backyard. And, you know, the interesting thing about it is when I was a resident and when the, these guys were residents, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit. It wasn't really- you know, on our radar, this is in a whole nother group of the plastic surgery division at the University of Michigan. So it just kind of talks about your modesty as a, as a leader. You know, this is absolutely groundbreaking stuff that you're doing here. We, we didn't really hear much about it back then, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm sure everyone who sees the, this type of work that you're doing must ask, <laughs> okay, so when can I get this? For myself or my yeah. you know yeah so my patients so we're working through we've implanted now two different patients we're in a, what's called the fda ide clinical trial so the fda is really monitoring every single person really really carefully to make sure it's safe to make sure that there's no problems with anything um and uh we just keep implanting people we have another one coming up here soon and one shortly after that uh, and we're doing all this monitoring and then we keep going back to the FDA saying, okay, when are we done? When are we done? When can we make this available? 
Um, the nice thing about it is, is the actual surgery itself could be accomplished by any hand surgeon in the world. So it isn't like it's something so challenging that people can't get it done, which means that it's scalable to the world. Mm-hmm. And, and if we can start doing all the work around showing how well they're doing functionally and satisfaction measures and return to work and all these things, now all of a sudden we can actually make a really good argument for insurance companies to cover this. And then when insurance companies cover this, now it's, now it's available. So, Paul, what, um, you know, I see this and I see the amount of money that this might take to develop and the amount of, uh, you know, FDA resources to, to follow this. What, why wouldn't a patient just want a, a transplant hand from a, from a cadaver? What, tell, me, tell me what the, your thoughts are. Why, why go the mechanical route? Why not just transplant a hand? Yeah, so the great, I mean, that is a great question. That's a question we talk about all the time. So the biggest challenge with transplant hands are people need to take immunosuppression and they need to take a lot of immunosuppression. And when they take that immunosuppression, bad things happen. They get, they can get liver toxicity, kidney toxicity, heart toxicity. They can get bad infections they otherwise wouldn't get. They can get cancers and people actually die from it. And so if you're replacing, I understand if somebody needs a new heart and they can't survive without a heart, they need a heart transplant. And and then all those other things just come along with it. But if somebody can get by without a hand or there's other substitutes and they don't have to take all that immunosuppression, then it's, then it's fine. The other thing is, is if you have an amputation up high in your arm, the nerves that grow back to that transplant take so long to grow back that by the time they get there, nothing works that well. So the hands don't work very well. So, so I got to tell you, I mean, I want the transplant surgeons to keep working on that. I want, if they can make the immunosuppression better, there might be really good opportunities for transplanting, transplant a single finger, maybe transplant a ear, transplant a nose. If immunosuppression doesn't hurt people. Mm-hmm. But at least for now, the control we get with the prosthetic hand is really good, and it's so safe. Paul, how large is your group, and who's funding you guys? Uh, so a majority of the funding that we've gotten has been from DARPA and the Department of Defense. So DARPA is a group through the Department of Defense that funds all this high-risk, high-yield research. So I love DARPA. So DARPA will have a project and they will fund 25 people, but then they will just keep cutting people if they're not making progress until they get to the end. They might only be funding three or four at the end of the whole grant period. But you know what? I love working that way. I'll work that way all day long. If I tell you I'm doing it and I don't do it, take my money. You should have to do that. The internet was founded in part by DARPA research, actually. satellites, internet, all that stuff, underwater welding, all that stuff is DARPA. Yeah. And then the Department of Defense has funded a lot. The NIH has funded it some. And actually our group in the Plastic in plastic Surgery, the plastic surgery Foundation has funded some of the work and the foundation for the American Society for Surgery of the Hand has funded, has funded a lot of it. And, uh, and how, how many people are, are part of this team that are developing this? Because it would seem like you would need hundreds of people to be working on this. Yeah, so our team right now, so my lab has about 14 people in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then there's a number of other labs I interface with. Cindy Trestek is a very close collaborator of mine. Cindy is in biomedical engineering. She probably has eight people in her lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we have a bunch of other people. We have mechanical engineers, Brent Gillespie, who's part of it. Um, In exercise physiology, Deanna Gates has been working real closely with us. So we have a lot of different labs, but I think the key to success for these kinds of things, if you want to make a big splash, it's about putting a good team together and making sure that everyone does that thing that they're really good at. Um, And everyone shares in the limelight. Everyone has an opportunity to publish, present, get grants, all that stuff. And no one is too selfish about anything. And I think we have such an amazing team and that's why things have gone so well. So many people doing so much good work. Now, Paul, Paul, how, how did you uh, how did this become an area of interest for you? Um, you know, obviously, you had um, some uh, 
your undergraduate training was in biomedical engineering. Obviously, you got some interest in that. But how, how did you how did you uh, sort of get into this as a plastic surgeon? Yeah, so I don't even know. Some of you might have remembered, but I, I had this patient that he was moving an aluminum ladder, moving an aluminum ladder on a wet day, and the aluminum ladder had an arc from a high voltage line, and he got electrocuted. Had a fifty percent total body surface area burn. He was a national level power lifter and he had burned his arm off. And uh, I had operated on him, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 times. And he was, that guy would tell me every time I saw him, all the struggles that he was having with, with his life and doing all the things. And I'm like, at that point, I'm like, I got to work on this. I got to, I got to figure out a way to, to get him something better than what's out there. And, uh, and he since has become just a close, a close friend of mine, even though he's a big Michigan state fan, um, <laughs> he's, uh, he's still become, he's such an inspiration to me and the guy's amazing, but that was really one of those moments for me that said, I got to work on this thing because I got to make this better if I can. It's pretty amazing. We've known you for a really long time and to see you come to this part of your career where we've seen other, like uh, Sam says, other people have become chairman. We see what they're like. They're very different from what you are. Um, it's it's pretty crazy. I, I mean, I don't know you guys. I remember one of my first earliest memories of Paul was sitting in the OR and Limp Biscuit came on, Nookie, and he <laughs> turned it on yeah. so loud. The nurses were like, please, could you turn this down? And he actually did not turn it down. He left it on as loud as possible. And it was, you know, that style was sort of emblematic of what you did back then. And I actually, I hope you still do at this point. Yeah. Uh, he's a, he's a true bro. He's a true bro. A true bro. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, the, the reality is the world is full of really, really smart people. And uh, I mean, I, I love what I do and I work really hard at, at what I do and I love doing it that way, but I'm not, I'm not going to do anything differently for sure. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to be a different person. And so I think some of the, you know, I'm a small town guy from the upper peninsula of Michigan, you know, not a particularly strong reader, not a, <laughs> not a, not a particularly you, scholastic style guy. You uh, clearly so did I, not clearly did not go to the uh, Derek Zoolander school of kids that can't read good. <laughs> I know, but, but you know, I'm not a, I'm not a silver spoon kid. I'm not a private school kid. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm none of those things. And, and so I, I'm, I'm still pretty much the same, the same as I've always been. I just work really hard, you know, and been lucky and had good people around me. And I think some of the leadership roles I've gotten, I think I get them because I'm, it's a little refreshing because I'm just, different and uh um and that limp biscuit moment you know i am sure that happened a lot because in that era we lived in a limp biscuit you know? <laughs> exactly and we lived in a lot of Lincoln park and other stuff back then so, so paul uh, we're, ju we're just about running out of time but i got one last question for you obviously you know you're a you're a high functioning individual you're incredibly successful you you deliver um value um but you're incredibly busy i i know you personally as having a lot of other interests outside of medicine you know as a a skier a, a cyclist um, um a uh uh you know boater so tell us what how do you get it all done how do you you know how do you balance all this yeah so from I got to tell you, for me, a hockey um, player too. I forgot a hockey player. Yeah, for me, it's about efficiency. It's about efficiency. So I get something in front of me, and I am so focused on that thing and getting that thing done. And then when I'm done with it, I don't, I don't linger over it. Then I move on and get something else done. So I'm, I'm just really efficient. You know, um, the thing is, is for a long time, I was able to get more done just by shrinking the amount of time I slept. But at some time, at some point, yeah. so then at that point, what you do is you have to start building teams around you, teams of people that you trust, that you believe in, that you empower to do things. And then as you build that around you, then you can have people working with you alongside of you, arm in arm, getting more things done. And um, so I don't, 
I don't waste a lot of time. I don't hang around a lot doing anything. And so if I get home and I'm going to get some exercise, I change and I go get my exercise. I go really, really hard. And then when I'm done, if I need to get some stuff done back on my computer, I'm back on my computer, totally focused on it, getting stuff done. But it's always about, it's always about compartmentalizing, being super efficient, building teams around you in all aspects. So like from a leadership standpoint for the section, I have so many great people that I work with that are so much better than me. And I just have to have touch points with them once a day, something like that. And, and then they keep getting huge amounts of stuff done. In the lab, I have a bunch of incredibly talented people. Steve Kemp is a PhD that I work with closely in the lab. He has that army of people in the lab going all the time. He and I touch base every day, uh, but not for that long. You know, and so I, I really think it's all about that. I mean, it is easy. I got to tell so for me, all in all the time, all in all the time on everything I do, there is, there's no half ass in it ever. So I'm, if I'm doing it, I'm all in on it. And, uh, so, the, and I, so then where do you see yourself going with this? You're now chairman, you have all this stuff going on. So five years, 10 years, or how long do you stay with what you're doing? As long as I love it. So I'll tell you, I think at, at some point I'll let the, the chairman role go. Uh, because I think, you know, there's younger people, it'd be a great experience for younger people to take over that part of it. And, and then I would focus back on um, more time on my research, more time on teaching, more time on operating, more time water skiing, you know, <laughs> sore ribs right now from a week ago. From a crash. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, it's uh, it's really been fantastic. Uh, we'll we'll have to have you out here in San Diego again and and get another surf session. She was out here in February and we uh, we killed it, so it was great. Um, well, Paul, once again, thank you for joining us. A true honor to have you on the podcast here. And um, gentlemen, we will sign off, I guess, huh? All right, go blue. Thank you so much. Go blue. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great.